Preface The feeling of having no power over people and events is generally unbearable to us. When we feel helpless, we feel miserable. No one wants less power. Everyone wants more. In the world today, however, it is dangerous to seem too power-hungry, to be overt with your power moves. We have to seem fair and decent. So, we need to be subtle, congenial, yet cunning, democratic, yet devious. Law 35. Master the art of timing. Judgment. Never seem to be in a hurry. Hurrying betrays a lack of control over yourself and over time. Always seem patient as if you know that everything will come to you eventually. Become a detective of the right moment. Sniff out the spirit of the times, the trends that will carry you to power. Learn to stand back when the time is not yet ripe and to strike fiercely when it has reached fruition. Observance of the Law Starting out in life as a nondescript French seminary school teacher, Joseph Fouché wandered from town to town for most of the decade of the 1780s, teaching mathematics to young boys. Yet, he never completely committed himself to the church, never took his vows as a priest. He had bigger plans. Patiently waiting for his chance, he kept his options open. And when the French Revolution broke out in 1789, Fouché waited no longer. He got rid of his cossack, grew his hair long, and became a revolutionary. For this was the spirit of the times. To miss the boat at this critical moment could have spelt disaster. Fouché did not miss the boat. Befriending the revolutionary leader Robespierre, he quickly rose in the rebel ranks. In 1792, the town of Nantes elected Fouché to be its representative to the National Convention, created that year to frame a new constitution for a French Republic. When Fouché arrived in Paris to take his seat at the convention, a violent rift had broken out between the moderates and the radical Jacobins. Fouché sensed that in the long run, neither side would emerge victorious. Power rarely ends up in the hands of those who start a revolution or even of those who further it. Power sticks to those who bring it to a conclusion. That was the side Fouché wanted to be on. His sense of timing was uncanny. He started as a moderate, for moderates were in the majority. When the time came to decide on whether or not to execute Louis XVI, however, he saw that the people were clamoring for the king's head, so he cast the deciding vote for the guillotine. Now he had become a radical. Yet, as tensions came to the boil in Paris, he foresaw the danger of being too closely associated with any one faction, so he accepted a position in the provinces where he could lay low for a while. A few months later, he was assigned to the post of proconsul in Lyon, where he oversaw the execution of dozens of aristocrats. At a certain moment, however, he called a halt to the killings, sensing that the mood of the country was turning, and despite the blood already on his hands, the citizens of Lyon hailed him as a savior from what had become known as the Terror. So far, Fouché had played his cards brilliantly, but in 1794, his old friend Robespierre recalled him to Paris to account for his actions in Lyon. Robespierre had been the driving force behind the terror. He had sent heads on both the right and the left, rolling, and Fouché, whom he no longer trusted, seemed destined to provide the next head. Over the next few weeks, a tense struggle ensued, while Robespierre railed openly against Fouché, accusing him of dangerous ambitions and calling for his arrest, the crafty Fouché worked more indirectly, quietly gaining support among those who were beginning to tire of Robespierre's dictatorial control. Fouché was playing for time. He knew that the longer he survived, the more disaffected citizens he could rally against Robespierre. 
he had to have broad support before he moved against the powerful leader. He rallied support among both the moderates and the Jacobins, playing on the widespread fear of Robespierre. Everyone was afraid of being the next to go to the guillotine. It all came to fruition on July 27th. The convention turned against Robespierre, shouting down his usual lengthy speech. He was quickly arrested, and a few days later it was Robespierre's head, not Fouché's, that fell into the basket. When Fouché returned to the convention after Robespierre's death, he played his most unexpected move. Having led the conspiracy against Robespierre, he was expected to sit with the moderates, but, lo and behold, he once again changed sides, joining the radical Jacobins. For perhaps the first time in his life, he aligned himself with the minority. Clearly, he sensed a reaction stirring. He knew that the moderate faction that had executed Robespierre and was now about to take power would initiate a new round of the terror, this time against the radicals. In siding with the Jacobins then, Fouché was sitting with the martyrs of the days to come, the people who would be considered blameless in the troubles that were on their way. Taking sides with what was about to become the losing team was a risky gambit, of course, but Fouché must have calculated he could keep his head long enough to quietly stir up the populace against the moderates and watch them fall from power. And indeed, although the moderates did call for his arrest in December of 1795 and would have sent him to the guillotine, too much time had passed. The executions had become unpopular with the people, and Fouché survived the swing of the pendulum one more time. A new government took over, the Directoire. It was not, however, a Jacobin government, but a moderate one more moderate than the government that had reimposed the terror. Fouché, the radical, had kept his head, but now he had to keep a low profile. He waited patiently on the sidelines for several years, allowing time to soften any bitter feelings against him. Then he approached the Directoire and convinced them he had a new passion, intelligence gathering. He became a paid spy for the government, excelled at the job, and in 1799 was rewarded by being made Minister of Police. Now he was not just empowered, but required to extend his spying to every corner of France, a responsibility that would greatly reinforce his natural ability to sniff out where the wind was blowing. One of the first social trends he detected, in fact, came in the person of Napoleon, a brash young general whose destiny he right away saw was entwined with the future of France. When Napoleon unleashed a coup d'etat on November 9, 1799, Fouché pretended to be asleep. Indeed, he slept the whole day. For this indirect assistance, it might have been thought his job, after all, to prevent a military coup. Napoleon kept him on as Minister of Police in the new regime. Over the next few years, Napoleon came to rely on Fouché more and more. He even gave this former revolutionary a title, Duke of Otranto, and rewarded him with great wealth. By 1808, however, Fouché, always attuned to the times, sensed that Napoleon was on the downswing. His feudal war with Spain, a country that posed no threat to France, was a sign that he was losing a sense of proportion. Never one to be caught on a sinking ship, Fouché conspired with Talleyrand to bring about Napoleon's downfall. Although the conspiracy failed, Talleyrand was fired. Fouché stayed, but was kept on a tight leash. It publicized a growing discontent with the emperor, who seemed to be losing control. By 1814, Napoleon's power had crumbled and Allied forces finally conquered him. The next government was a restoration of the monarchy in the form of King Louis XVIII, brother of Louis XVI. Fouché, his nose always sniffing the air for the next social shift, knew Louis would not last long. He had none of Napoleon's flair. 
Boucher once again played his waiting game, laying low, staying away from the spotlight. Sure enough, in February of 1815, Napoleon escaped from the island of Elba, where he had been imprisoned. Louis XVIII panicked. His policies had alienated the citizenry, who were clamoring for Napoleon's return. So Louis turned to the one man who could maybe have saved his hide, Fouché, the former radical who had sent his brother Louis XVI to the guillotine, but was now one of the most popular and widely admired politicians in France. Fouché, however, would not side with a loser. He refused Louis's request for help by pretending that his help was unnecessary, by swearing that Napoleon would never return to power, although he knew otherwise. A short time later, of course, Napoleon and his new citizen army were closing in on Paris. Seeing his reign about to collapse, feeling that Fouché had betrayed him, and certain that he did not want this powerful and able man on Napoleon's team, King Louis ordered the minister's arrest and execution. On March 16, 1815, policemen surrounded Fouché's coach on a Paris boulevard. Was this finally his end? Perhaps, but not immediately. Fouché told the police that an ex-member of government could not be arrested on the street. They fell for the story and allowed him to return home. Later that day, though, they came to his house and once again declared him under arrest. Fouché nodded, but would the officers be so kind as allow a gentleman to wash and to change his clothes before leaving his house for the last time? They gave their permission, Fouché left the room, and the minutes went by. Fouché did not return. Finally, the policemen went into the next room, where they saw a ladder against an open window, leading down to the garden below. That day and the next, the police combed Paris for Fouché, but by then, Napoleon's cannons were audible in the distance, and the king and all the king's men had to flee the city. As soon as Napoleon entered Paris, Fouché came out of hiding. He had cheated the executioner once again. Napoleon greeted his former minister of police and gladly restored him to his old post. During the 100 days that Napoleon remained in power until Waterloo, it was essentially Fouché who governed France. After Napoleon fell, Louis XVIII returned to the throne, and like a cat with nine lives, Fouché stayed on to serve in yet another government. By then, his power and influence had grown so great that not even the king dared challenge him. Interpretation In a period of unprecedented turmoil, Joseph Fouché thrived through his mastery of the art of timing. He teaches us a number of key lessons. First, it is critical to recognize the spirit of the times. Fouché always looked two steps ahead found the wave that would carry him to power, and rode it. You must always work with the times, anticipate their twists and turns, and never miss the boat. Sometimes the spirit of the times is obscure. Recognize it not by what is loudest and most obvious in it, but by what lies hidden and dormant. Look forward to the Napoleons of the future rather than holding on to the ruins of the past. Second, recognizing the prevailing winds does not necessarily mean running with them. Any potent social movement creates a powerful reaction, and it is wise to anticipate what that reaction will be, as Fouché did after the execution of Robespierre. Rather than ride the cresting wave of the moment, wait for the tide's ebb to carry you back to power. Upon occasion, bet on the reaction that is brewing and place yourself in the vanguard of it. Finally, Fouché had remarkable patience. Without patience as your sword and shield, your timing will fail and you will inevitably find yourself a loser. When the times were against Fouché, he did not struggle, get emotional, or strike out rashly. He kept his cool 
and maintained a low profile, patiently building support among the citizenry, the bulwark, in his next rise to power. Whenever he found himself in the weaker position, he played for time, which he knew would always be his ally if he was patient. Recognize the moment then, to hide in the grass, or slither under a rock, as well as the moment to bare your fangs and attack. Keys to Power There are three kinds of time for us to deal with. Each presents problems that can be solved with skill and patience. First, there is long time, the drawn-out, years-long kind of time that must be managed with patience and gentle guidance. Our handling of long time should be mostly defensive. This is the art of not reacting impulsively, of waiting for opportunity. Next, there is forced time, the short time that we can manipulate as an offensive weapon, upsetting the timing of our opponent. Finally, there is end time, when a plan must be executed with speed and force. We have waited, found the moment, and must not hesitate. Long time. When you force the pace out of fear and impatience, you create a nest of problems that require fixing, and you end up taking much longer than if you had taken your time. Hurriers may occasionally get there quicker, but papers fly everywhere, new dangers arise, and they find themselves in constant crisis mode, fixing the problems that they themselves have created. Sometimes, not acting in the face of danger is your best move. You wait. You deliberately slow down. As time passes, it will eventually present opportunities you had not imagined. Waiting involves controlling not only your own emotions, but those of your colleagues who, mistaking action for power, may try to push you into making rash moves. In your rivals, on the other hand, you can encourage this same mistake if you let them rush headlong into trouble while you stand back and wait. You will soon find right moments to intervene and pick up the pieces. You do not deliberately slow time down to live longer, or to take more pleasure in the moment, but the better to play the game of power. First, when your mind is uncluttered by constant emergencies, you will see further into the future. Second, you will be able to resist the baits that people dangle in front of you, and will keep yourself from becoming another impatient sucker. Third, you will have more room to be flexible. Opportunities will inevitably arise that you had not expected and would have missed had you forced the pace. Fourth, you will not move from one deal to the next without completing the first one. To build your power's foundation can take years. Make sure that foundation is secure. Do not be a flash in the pan. Success that is built up slowly and surely is the only kind that lasts. Forced Time The trick in forcing time is to upset the timing of others, to make them hurry, to make them wait, to make them abandon their own pace, to distort their perception of time. By upsetting the timing of your opponent while you stay patient, you open up time for yourself, which is half the game. Making people wait is a powerful way of forcing time, as long as they do not figure out what you are up to. You control the clock. They linger in limbo and rapidly come unglued, opening up opportunities for you to strike. The opposite effect is equally powerful. You make your opponents hurry, start off your dealings with them slowly, then suddenly apply pressure, making them feel that everything is happening at once. People who lack the time to think will make mistakes, so set their deadlines for them. This was the technique Machiavelli admired in Cesare Borgia, who, during negotiations, would suddenly press vehemently for a decision, upsetting his opponent's timing and patience. For who would dare make Cesare wait? End time. You can play the game with the utmost artistry, waiting patiently for the right moment to act, putting your competitors off their form by messing with their timing. 
but it won't mean a thing unless you know how to finish. Do not be one of those people who look like paragons of patience, but are actually just afraid to bring things to a close. Patience is worthless unless combined with a willingness to fall ruthlessly on your opponent at the right moment. You can wait as long as necessary for the conclusion to come, but when it comes, it must come quickly. Use speed to paralyze your opponent, cover up any mistakes you might make, and impress people with your aura of authority and finality. With the patience of a snake charmer, you draw the snake out with calm and steady rhythms. Once the snake is out, though, would you dangle your foot above its deadly head? There is never a good reason to allow the slightest hitch in your end game. Your mastery of timing can really only be judged by how you work with end time, how you quickly change the pace and bring things to a swift and definitive conclusion. <laughs>